Hey friends and fans, Christy from Happy and Healthy TV here with you guys tonight, filming a documentary on 100 Days of a Girl with Lyme. I think we're on day 18, I've got to go back and do some edits. So first off, let me apologize to you guys, I've been MIA for quite a while, uh, a lot of stuff going on um, that's personal, um, but rest assured I'm doing as best as I can with some of the challenges that I'm facing right now, um, and some really crazy blessings in disguise, I suppose, if you want to call them that. Anyway, um, today's topic of conversation is uh, a project that I've been doing with a lot of my Lyme pals, which I'm really excited to bring out to you guys. Um, most of you know I belong to several different Lyme support groups. I'm very active um, in terms of just being supportive for others and also uh, with my expertise in nutrition and functional neuro. And anything I can do to help a fellow Lyme, totally down with that. So uh, a few things came up that I found that were interesting this week that I just wanted to highlight. Um, I had one mother contact me who um, had also lost a daughter, as well as I have, uh, going almost eight years ago, uh, to congenital Lyme. And somebody from the Mayo Clinic was arguing with her that this isn't the case. Um, so I was able to help her out, actually, by sending her my daughter's autopsy, which showed that she had triplidy and congenital Lyme. So it's pretty crazy. Um, but we're trying the best we can to educate people. So that was a, a really uh, touching moment for me to be able to help somebody else who's been through such a similar ordeal. So that was one thing that I found uh, to be great. The other cool thing is that we've got a really big project going on. There's a lot of us involved with this. Um, there are so many people suffering with Lyme uh, and chronic Lyme specifically. And I found a chart, which I'd love to post on this video when I get better at editing and I can go ahead and do this, which showed a list of chronic health conditions. And I, it's interesting. Uh, one of my dear friends actually is in congestive heart failure um, I've dealt with some major issues with my heart, and it was showing the quality of life for somebody with Lyme was actually worse than somebody in congestive heart failure. So I can definitely attest to that. Um, obviously, you guys know I've had periods of time where I've been in and out of remission, and uh, I work my butt off to get myself back into it. Uh, but of course, as we know, there are no clear-cut treatment protocols. So as I've had conversations over the past year or so, uh, particularly over the past six months with people, what we've been looking to do is actually look to the CDC and different uh, parts of the legislature, you know, governing bodies, um, senators, uh, obviously legislature, uh, legislators, excuse me, uh, all the way up to President Trump. I mean, we've sent stuff off to him as well. What we are looking to do is fight for rights for people with Lyme. Uh, for example, one of the biggest issues I hear all the time is that coverage for Lyme, of course, is not, or anything Lyme related is not covered under insurance. Um, even if you have a positive CDC case, which means more than five bands showing up on a Lyme test that are positive, guess what? If you need a pick line or something like that, 90% of the time, it's just not a covered service. So uh, as a nutritionist, do I think that it's a good thing to do a pick line? I think it depends on an individual situation. Like I would say with anything else, um, I respect bioindividuality, which essentially means that everyone's body is different um, and no two things are correct for the same person. But I wanted to uh, go ahead and give you guys some good news. So I'm going to pull this up on my laptop here. And I'm going to go ahead and read this to you because I don't remember it verbatim. Uh, however, go Pennsylvania for this. Uh, Pennsylvania has actually just passed a bill to cover Lyme treatment. Now, I'm really excited about that. It is a step in the right direction. So yay for that. So that's really, really wonderful. My only concern with this is that it does not list specific criteria for this. So, for example, uh, if you're not a CDC positive case, like myself, um, even though it's all over my medical records, is this still something that's going to be treatable? I would presume uh, there would, you know, this bill would go into further um, amendments and so forth over time because, of course, people that have clinical symptoms of Lyme and do show a positive on, set, on testing, for example, my cerebral spinal fluid shows up positive for Lyme testing so or, or Lyme um, spirochetes. So you'd think at that point, you know, again, this of course, even that it's all over my medical records, yeah, I would be a candidate to be treated for that. It's unclear as to whether or not that is the case. So I know there are many, 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 many people that are in the same boat as myself. Um, and then also, it doesn't detail anything for co-infections. Again, not being negative, it's just interesting to see you know, what's going on in Pennsylvania. So let me go ahead and read this for you guys. Oops, give me one second. Let me just pull it back up. Okay. So let me just get this uh, clicked up here. 
so we can go through this. So, you know, again, I think that if Pennsylvania is doing this, other states are absolutely going to follow suit to this, and that is very exciting to me. Particular places in the Northeast, um, you guys know I'm based in New York. Um, I've got a lot of Limey Pals in New Jersey, and then even outside, obviously, of those areas. California is a big place for Lime, as we know, but it's all over the country. I mean, let's get real here. Um, if the most recent map that I looked at that looked at Lyme was looking at, you know, Canada. We know it's in Europe. We know it's in Asia. So it's all over the place. So um, let's check this out. So this is uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This was reported out of the Pennsylvania legislature has moved legislation that would require health insurers to cover long-term treatments for Lyme disease. So currently right now, if you guys don't know the law, um, a prophylactic or a beginning dosage, if you just have gotten bit by a tick, uh, you really should be going to your doctor and requesting a prophylactic dosage. Oh, good, goodness. Just so trying to play a video for us. Sorry about that, guys. Um, you should really request a prophylactic dosage of uh, doxycycline or uh, amoxicillin or rocephin or something. Uh, we know early treatment is the best to wind up without uh, chronic Lyme disease. And chronic Lyme disease can take years to decimate. And we, we do also know that it it is... Um, Depicted on somebody's overall immune system, uh, the level of inflammation, excuse me, that they have in their body. Um, and so there's quite a few factors that go into it. Toxin overload, um, you know, the body's ability to have a healthy gut flora and a healthy gut microbiome. So there's a quite a few factors included. But anyway, so that looks at that part of it. Um, so currently, again, short-term treatments are covered, although a lot of times you will be hard-pressed to find a doctor that will actually do that. So I would always recommend, as you guys know, to see an LLMD, a Lyme Literate Medical Doctor. The bill goes on to say, the State House of Representatives approved House Bill Number 629 uh, with a this week, excuse me, by a vote of 158 to 34, uh, which sends the measure to the Senate to the Senate for consideration, which is amazing. The proposal was made by Representative Katie Rapp. Uh, follow Katie Rapp. She's fantastic. Um, require insurers to cover treatment plans for Lyme disease and related tick-borne illnesses as prescribed by a healthcare provider, regardless of whether the treatment plan includes short or long-term antibiotic treatment. So again, this is dealing with antibiotics, but again, it's a step in the right direction. I'm, I'm pretty pleased to hear this. In, uh, in her bill, Rapp wrote that a 2013 study by the CDC and prevention found that only 39% of people were Lyme disease were treated using short-term antibiotics. So I'm not included with that. It was not treated with short-term. While the majority was treated for longer periods. I've been treated for longer periods as I wound up with Lyme carditis in 2011. And then again was treated for Lyme meningitis in 2013. So the question is, did it really go away? Obviously it did not. Um, it just migrated to a different part of the body, which Lyme likes to do, unfortunately. Bill goes on to say, from 1990 to 2017, Pennsylvania reported 116,824 confirmed cases of Lyme disease. And in 2017, so this is now two years old already, reported 11,900 new cases, ranking the state the highest in the nation in confirmed cases in the last seven years. Holy cow. Um, my cousins live in Pennsylvania. Got a lot of friends that live there. Um, certainly that's like our back door or our neighbors uh, here in New York, as well as New Jersey. So, um, and then you go up the whole northeastern seaboard, and you're going to see this, including, you know, outside of the seaboard, you're starting to get into the Midwest and, like, Michigan and things like that. That is a lot of cases. I mean, these are people that are suffering from this and needlessly be suffering. Um, again, somebody had given me an antibiotic back in 07 when I got bit twice, not once, but twice. Um, you know, I did all the right things, brought the tick in, you know, had the it was supposed to, wanted to have the tick tested. Nobody did anything. They threw the tick away. Had that not happened, you know, I certainly wouldn't have wound up with a laundry list of health calamities. So uh, go, 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 Representative Kathy Rapp for this. Um, the reason that she became an advocate for those with Lyme, uh, she had a family member who, who had Lyme and then uh, wound up finding other family members who passed away from it. Uh, Lyme is no joke. Uh, I had recently read a story, and this is like super sad for Disney fanatic me that uh, everybody always jokes about this. There was a gentleman who had gone down to Disney with his family, and you know he had been sick for quite a while. He had a heart condition; nobody was able to figure it out. Uh, turned out, this poor gentleman had Lyme carditis, and God rest his soul, 
drop dead like in the middle of the Magic Kingdom. So um, I guess that's why Disney does not call themselves the most uh, happiest place on earth. Obviously, you know, a terrible thing has occurred. I'm sure he's not the only person, sadly, that has died in Disney World. But whatever the case is, you know, that has nothing to do with the location. The fact that this man was told over and over again, oh, yeah, you have a heart condition, but we don't know what to do with it. Totally can relate to that. Uh, it took a long time for my cardiologist to figure out, yeah, this is Lyme carditis. This is not something else. And the conditions that arise from Lyme carditis are quite interesting because you do. You put yourself in a situation where, quite frankly, you could literally drop dead at any point in time. Uh, I've had a lot of scares over the years with having something called Tacky Brady Syndrome. In addition to having POT syndrome, which is post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, and it's, it's it's interesting. It waxes and wanes. So sometimes it's, it's bothering me. Sometimes it's not. Um, unfortunately, nutritionist me who hates drugs, like all drugs, uh, pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical, I, I just believe in taking supplements and eating extremely well, uh, was very disheartened to have to eventually go on a beta blocker because my heart rate likes to jump up into like, I'm not even kidding, like the 230s. But then with having tacky brady, then it likes to also uh, equally jump down. So I've had heart rates go down in the hospital as low as like 30 BPM, which is really bad. Um, granted, I'm an athlete, so I have a lower BPM than the general person does. However, it's still absolutely not normal to have your heart rate go down that low. I mean, you're really leaving yourself susceptible to losing oxygen. So, you know, this video is not obviously on Lyme carditis, but... I just found that to be a, such a sad story that this gentleman went on vacation with his family. They're in this very happy, positive place. And this poor man is just walking around and all of a sudden, boom, hits the floor and that's the end of him. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. I would love to get a panel of cardiologists together who are looking at things like this. Because it's just, there are a lot of people that suffer from Lyme carditis. And it is, forgive my language, a bitch to diagnose. Um, and unless you're working with a good LM, LLMD or a cardiologist that is privy to this, it's a problem. So uh, I think this bill is going to help a lot of people. I do think it needs to be refined and there are things that need to be added to it. However, I do respect Representative, uh, Representative Rapp's uh, stance on this. And I believe that if Pennsylvania is doing this, other states are going to follow this, which is awesome. So I do ask you to share this video far and wide as a part of one of my line groups uh, with a young lady, Holly Nicole, who's amazing. Holly has been um, just a beacon of light with things and is suffering from Lyme herself. At the same time, like a lot of us Limeys, we're all out there. We're trying to serve other people, help as many people as we possibly can, um, and of course also help each other because a lot of times we have to be our own advocates. Um, I had posted something pretty interesting the other day. This is a funny one. Um, that got a lot of kickback on social media, like a lot of kickback. There were so many people that responded to this, uh, more on my Lyme uh, support groups, of course, because, uh, you know, the general population that I post stuff to you know, probably doesn't want to hear about this all the time. But this post came from uh, Rosie Fusco, who actually, she's amazing. I, I think Rosie is one of the coolest people ever. Uh, does a really great non-for-profit organization called Lime Angels, and she's always constantly, or excuse me, Hand Up for Lime. That's a different, uh, that's her organization, uh, Rosie's, uh, where we donate money, uh, you know, once a month, a dollar a month to help somebody else with Lime. So this is what Rosie posts the other day, and I'm like, yeah, this is dead on. And then I'll read to you guys what I posted as an adjunct to this because this is so true. Okay, so um, this post reads: This is how people are abused. Uh, forgive my language here, guys. I don't know nothing thing about Lyme disease, but I'm going to tell you. Oops, let me move this over. Thanks, Maurice, for sending me messages. Um, <laughs> so the doctor going back and saying this. I don't know an effing thing about Lyme disease, but I'm going to tell you that you don't have it. Then I'm going to label you as a neurotic, anxious idiot who needs psychiatric medicine. This kills people. Yeah. You know, you want to talk about abuse. Um... I, unfortunately, I've been no stranger to that in my life. I've had a lot of crazy things, also equally amazing things happen to me. So, I, you know, certainly not complaining. You know, people deal with things. But imagine what it's like going to the doctor and over and over again. I'm going to read to you what my add-on to this was. This is so going in my next book. Um, so I'm going to borrow this post. I have to find out who actually had originally put it up. Rosie, I think, had sent me the link. But imagine you go to the doctor. You know that you have this condition. And no one pays attention to it. That would be equally as irresponsible as somebody who has AIDS 
or has cancer, God forbid, or some very, very serious disease. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, I know you have this, but get out of my office. Are you serious? Sorry. You know, practitioner me can go ahead and say something about this. So uh, this is what I wrote above that particular post. So I, my comment was, I find this to be interesting. I have had so many positive Lyme tests, and it is all over my re medical records, including diagnoses like sarcoidosis, which is secondary to Lyme, uh, epilepsy, secondary to Lyme disease. The list goes on and on and on. I'm not going to bore you with the whole crazy uh, long list of the health conditions that I had that arose from Lyme. I was perfectly healthy outside of having Crohn's disease prior to Lyme, which, by the way, was in remission due to nutrition and exercise and some of the um, protocols in my first book, the IBD Healing Plan and Recipe book. Anyway, I went on to say, so here's the question. And some doctors get angry at me for this. Man, if I got into fights with physicians, but all good. Uh, but I politely and respectfully challenge them with this. I hope this helps my Lyme pals. Number one. Okay, so you're telling me I don't have Lyme. Then why is it all over my medical records? Wouldn't you have taken it off if you didn't think I didn't have it? Why would a previously healthy female who eats extremely well, meditates, is an athlete, uh, who believes in the law of attraction and Jesus, uh, who has an outstanding support network and is always doing her best to stay positive no matter what, just want to be sick. I'm not a malingerer, nor do I possess the qualities of an individual with somatization disorder, so your opinion makes absolutely no sense. Two, as a practitioner myself, mind you guys, I have eight years of uh, schooling behind me in four different schools, including Columbia, um, and have a master's degree in science and integrative nutrition, in addition to being mentored for an for another eight years uh, by Dr. Robert Malil, who taught me everything that was possible that was possibly to know um, at that point in time about functional neuro. So while I am not a neurologist, I do have background in that and certainly have worked with thousands of children who deal with neural behavioral disorder. So I do feel like I have some authority to speak on that um, because part of my job was to train other physicians and dietitians on protocols with nutrition and, and how they related to neuro. But anyway, um, so again, as a practitioner myself, the appropriate way to treat a patient is to look at clinical symptoms, right? Any good practitioner knows this, and then back it up with testing. So if I possess dozens of clinical symptoms, and this is backed up by testing in my cerebral spinal fluid, and by Western blot analyzer testing, and fish testing, how could you acknowledge this does not exist? Hello, doctor. So I have a doctor that will look at me like, I don't know. Are, are you kidding me? You know, it's like, what's going on? Three, so now you've come to the conclusion that, conclusion that I'm just bonkers. All right. Quite the contrary. And I want to ask a physician a lot of times if they got their license from a Cracker Jack box. You went to school for eight years. You don't understand what's going on. Investigate it. Look for it. Unfortunately, doctors are not trained in this. So this is no offense to any physician who simply is just going by the CDC's guidelines and they don't know any better. Um, wake up, America. This has got to change. Four. If you left doctor's appointments or the hospital and were constantly, oops, and were constantly dismissed, lost your ability to do things you love, and then had doctors who don't simply acknowledge this, wouldn't you too be out of your darn mind at times? You're not kidding. Do you know how many times I've left doctor's offices like hysterical crying all the whole way home and then had to pull it together so I was okay to make sure my son didn't realize how upset I was? Um... It happens often, and it happens to just about everybody I know with Lyme. It's extraordinarily frustrating. So this is what I always tell people. My rule of thumb working with all patients, no matter what somebody said to me, was that I always acknowledged what was real to them and then investigated what was going on, right? My job as a holistic nutritionist is to look at the whole picture, not just the little pieces, look at the bigger picture, right? Um, I would also tell my patients, if I do not have the answers to what is going on with you, then I will find someone that does. Fortunately, I have a large network of people that I've worked with over the years and very intelligent, amazing people. Somebody's got to know the answer. If you put it out there, somebody's going to find it. And surprise, my patients got better. I have not had one patient, not one patient in, in 11, 12 years that I have practiced on and off that did not see at least some improvement and or significant improvement to the point where we would be so excited where a patient would quote unquote graduate from our program because they didn't need us anymore. <clears throat> and that was that was amazing to see that. How many off times does that happen when you get stuck in the uh, healthcare or what I call sick care system where it just you kind of keep going in and out like a revolving door. 
Um, the other thing is to look at this. I validated every single one of my patients. Sure. Did I go over a health history sometimes? Be like, all right, there's something else going on here. Maybe this person has some psychological issues that are contributing. Maybe there's trauma contributing. But you know what? You still have to treat that too. You can't just leave somebody that's not um, physically healthy and then not look at the mind-body connection. So of course, I, I do recognize the importance of that. But to say to a patient, listen, I know this is real for you and I believe you. Those three words, I believe you. Validate a patient. At least so they realize that you know that they're, you're on their side and you're going to do everything that you can to help them achieve their wellness goals. Or whatever it happens to be. Um, so I this really hit home to me, um, this particular post. This is abuse. Being treated like this by a physician is abuse to me as far as I'm concerned. If a doctor doesn't know something, you should at least have the... Ability to have some humility and say, listen, I don't know the answer to every question. Shoot, I've been practicing for years. I do not know the answer to every question. And the days where I get to learn something new, I always say that's the best day. Because learning something new lets me help the next person even better. And lets me lets me help that current patient better. So let's get real here. Um, so this is just not okay. So what I urge everybody to do uh, with this big uh, project we got going on, Lyme Awareness Month is coming up next month. Uh, please contact your local senators, legislature, call President Trump, send him letters. We've been doing this. We're getting responses, believe it or not, which is pretty crazy uh, because this just has to stop. Um, and I will continue fighting until it does. I have um, my son who I have to fight for, my late daughter, um, and a surprise coming later in the year. Somebody else who I have to fight for here with this, who is, it's very, very important to me. Um, there are millions, literally millions of people out there like me. I am not the only person in the situation. You could go probe around and you'll find there are tons of people out there like myself, sadly, who are living a very different life than what they're used to based on having a diagnosis that a lot of physicians don't understand. And I don't want to say all physicians. Please don't think that I'm saying that in any way. I've had some amazing people that have worked by my side who have literally saved my life and have kept doing it and continue to do so. And for that, I'm extraordinarily grateful. But those are practitioners that are more open-minded, that are looking at different aspects of this and who are on the forefront of research. I don't play around. I don't work with people who are not paying attention to research and what's current. Uh, if I have a doctor that is uh, more stagnant and is not paying attention, uh, I'm not paying attention to as much. I'm sorry. No offense. No disrespect in intended in any way, shape, or form. Um, I feel like looking at the most current research is the very most important thing. We should all, as practitioners, always be researching. Certainly, I don't stop doing nutrition research just because I graduated from school. Oh, God. It's like 12, 13 years ago already since I graduated from school. So it's, it's been quite a while. Um, but if I stayed with the information that I knew 13 years ago, I'd be way behind the bell curve in terms of what's going on in the nutrition arena today. All right, so awareness is key. Uh, knowledge is power, as I always say. And, you know, when you're going to a doctor and you feel dismissed like this, which, you know, you can raise your hand on this uh, video if, if it's happened to you, don't let anybody take away your power. I've had a lot of people try to take my power away over the years. People tell me that I was, like I said, completely insane, like this little post had said, or anything like that, or just be really insulting on that. You know, it's actually the opposite. Um, when I was working with Dr. Mull, we had a large poster in his office, uh, something that, uh, it was a quote from Albert Einstein. I don't recall exactly what the quote was, but it was something to the effect of, you know, people are going to think, uh, you're crazy for maybe looking at things differently than somebody else. Um, and that, that is very true. And of course we know that a lot of Einstein's theories were proven to be true, uh, just like Christopher Columbus had his hypothesis that the world was round versus flat and people thought he was nuts and it turned out to be right. The first thing that is said a lot of times that a medical advancement is made when it's a new advancement that's crazy and it's impossible. Well, guess what? No, that person is just thinking outside of the box. Um, somebody had very rudely made a comment to me not long ago um, talking about a period of time where I was in the hospital and I inquired about cadmium poisoning because it is something that had come back on testing for myself. And thought that that was crazy because I dismissed what my doctor said. Oh, you're fine. You know what? Guess what? You might say that I'm fine, but I don't feel fine. And my body is not the same as it was. Also take a look at the fact that I was trained very differently than the average practitioner. Uh, my job is to look at biology. It's to look at toxin overload. It is to look at how each nutrient 
bounces off in place with the next. What dietary protocols are appropriate for somebody? How does that relate to medication the person is on? On and on and on and on. So, you know, in this particular instance, I had a physician who was being dismissive of symptoms I had. You know, again, this is just me doing the research. This comes from Invita slash Mayo Clinic. This wasn't bullcrap research um, that was pulled up here. Um, I tested positive for lead, mercury, and cad cadmium poisoning. And I think there was one other thing. It is no secret to anybody in the Lyme world or people with digestive disorders. I wrote about this in my first book. If you have a toxic burden in your body, you're not going to get better no matter what you do. There's a saying of, that I've said a million times, death starts in the colon. Um, it needs to be known uh, that if you're not absorbing nutrients properly, yeah, you're going to have major issues. You know, we know, do know that the body does not independently operate from one uh, part to the next. So if the liver is not working or the kidneys aren't working correctly, it all backs up. The intestines are dealing with all of this. Uh, so it is very important, especially for Lyme patients, you know, to detox and make sure that their bodies are clean uh, from any type of heavy metal. Uh, I've said the same teaching classes on amalgam fillings. When I was in my early 20s, I had all of my amalgam. I only had two, but I had my amalgam fillings removed. It's aluminum. I, I, you wouldn't tell your child to go suck on tinfoil all day. It is a byproduct. It's a waste product. And if you go back and look into the history of that, I can do a whole class on that just by itself. I've, I've taught them many times before. Extremely dangerous to the body. So, you know, if I'm questioning a doctor about something, it's not because I'm trying to be combative. It's not because I'm just trying to, oh, look, oh, look I'm sick. You know, I don't want to be sick. I'd much rather be off doing the things I used to do before or things that I didn't struggle with quite as much before. Oh, hello, Precious. It's come over to say hello. She's marking her territory as usual on my phone. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's an ignorant comment. I'm sorry. It really just is because you just don't understand, you know, what's going on. It is not an attention-seeking thing, uh, especially for somebody with Lyme. I know any person I've talked to with Lyme would way rather be back in the situation they had been in before in terms of I hear it all the time. I miss my old life. You know, I, I miss what I used to be able to do. And that's a common, a common, common thought for anybody with Lyme. And how could it not be based on all of this stuff? So, so that's my rant for, for everything tonight, guys. I'm so excited Pennsylvania has passed this bill. I believe it does need some more work. Um, but I want to keep updating you guys on the really neat things that are going on in the Lyme world that are positive. Um, so you guys will get another video from me hopefully soon. Um, again, I have quite a lot of things going on right now uh, where I'm just focusing on my own health and my child and uh, my family and friends. So um, that's been a big thing and also helping out the Lyme community. So we'll get another video out to you guys as soon as we can. If you have any questions on this, please hit the comment box below. I'm going to go ahead and uh, post a link to this um, this bill that was passed. So this way you guys can take a look at it for yourselves. Let me know what your opinion is on this. And please, 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 guys, urge you to contact local legislature, senators, uh, president, you know, whoever you need to uh, that are in your state. And if you need a list, I can give you stuff in the Northeast. Um, and if that's not where you live, you're on the West Coast, you're in the Midwest, certainly let me know and I can go ahead and find, uh, you know, uh, legislature that is paying attention to this type of stuff. All right, guys, so it's been a victory today for Lyme disease uh, patients, and I'm very glad to hear that, especially in Pennsylvania. Go PA, and I'm curious to see what comes out with that. Oh, goodness. Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everybody take it easy. I hope you guys have a great, great, great evening. Take care. Love you guys. Bye-bye.